Okay, let's go ahead and get started. As I said, we're on page 19. You figure page one went back to August, so we're making a little bit of progress. The book should be done by the... Yeah. No, I'm not going to take six years. <laughs> let's open a prayer. Father, as we come to you on this misty morning, we just thank you, Lord, for the differences in seasons uh, and times and all that we go through. Lord, just the beauty of each time of year. We're grateful for all that you give us. Your beauty is, is out there. We don't have to go looking very far to find your creativity, uh, your ability to show the, the splendor of your creation. So as we come together this morning, Lord, we just want to thank you for giving us all that. But more than anything, we thank you that you took those 1,400 years to give us the whole of the Bible that we now have in front of us. And we pray, Lord, that as we handle it, we would do it properly, carefully, always dependent upon not just our own readings, but each other to help us to understand things because you've taught each of us different things at different times. So Lord, may we be as iron sharpening iron uh, in helping each other. But more than anything, we ask you, Holy Spirit, that you would be here as our teacher, opening your word to us to help us to understand it, that we might glorify you in all that we do now as well as in eternity. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you notice I don't have the video, the uh, um, PowerPoint this morning. That's not because I forgot it or didn't have time for it. Just that you see most of the slides I was going to, I would have shown you to, uh, today, uh, just repeating a lot of what we've talked about before. But I'm going to focus more on these passages in Corinthians this morning, or this one passage, uh, because we're up to the next event that we have to look forward to in the future. We just finished talking for a couple of weeks on the resurrection that we had to look forward to, our getting our new bodies, and what it would be like in heaven. I, I labeled that as event number one. I really should have probably nailed, labeled that as event number two because all of that follows Jesus' return. And that really should have been the first event. And so what we're looking at this morning, I got labeled as event number two. Maybe that should really be event number three. I'm still learning as we go along, so maybe we'll just learn together. All right, but we want to take a look for a couple weeks at these, this whole concept of rewards. You know, I've, I've heard it said before that really we, we shouldn't be talking about rewards from God because he's given us so much already just in our salvation. But God talks about that. So why, why shouldn't we? And there's a lot to consider in here, and he'll give us a lot of information, which is why it took three, basically four pages of notes to really put all this together. And again, I, I want to thank my previous pastor, because most of these notes come from him. Uh, incredible uh, teacher that he was. I've collected a lot of his notes over the years. He went to be with the Lord back in 99, um, and gave me permission to use these. So I make changes in them as I go along. I don't teach the way he does, but a lot of what he put out, I could not improve on. A few things here and there. Cindy so corrects the grammar, uh, and we go from there. Yeah, I keep her busy with that. All right, the whole background on our study. Let's go ahead and look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. This passage we, we've talked about before, we did it last year when we studied Corinthians. We've done it this year in talking about uh, our future with the Lord. And now we're going to look at it in a slightly different way, just talking about what it is in terms of the background to understanding the rewards that we do have to look forward to in the future. So, in this chapter, though, it's really interesting to look at it simply because the book of Corinthians 
is, is in many ways one of the strangest books in the Bible and yet one of the most realistic because it's dealing with all the problems in the church. And this church had a lot of problems. I remember years ago, uh, somebody from the charismatic movement approached me and was asking about different gifts and everything. And I asked her, well, what church do you go to? And she said, well, the church was. And I said, well, is that part of anything else? She said, well, what kind of church is that? Her answer, right, without thinking about it, probably was, was taught to her. said, oh, we're just a New Testament church. I said, oh, really? Which one? I said, no, no, don't tell me. I'll, I'll bet you're the Corinthian church. Just constant problems. One thing after the other. Just problematic. No. I said, well, you've got to understand, every church in the New Testament is as different as every church is here now. You know, there's no similarities in, in the way the churches operate. It has different people in it. Different cultures, different backgrounds. I remember somebody saying one time, oh, Francis Schaeffer was always saying that his favorite church to study was the church in Antioch, where Paul spent some time teaching early on in his career. And his answer, his reply was about explaining it, was that it's probably the most metropolitan of all the churches in the New Testament. You had people from government levels down to peasants that were there. You had apparently different color people that were there. Uh, very integrated church in, in that sense. Uh, and that was, that became Paul's sending church that he kept going back to and reporting after each of his missionary journeys. But unfortunately, the Corinthian church was not like that. This church had a lot of beginnings. Let me go ahead and read. I'm going to read the first 10 verses to get you started. Just see if you can pick out some of the things that he's hitting at. What hits you as you hear these verses? But I, brothers and sisters of you, I just add that, it's just a general term. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not ready. You are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, you are not of the you you are not of the flesh and behaving are you not of the flesh and, and behaving only in a human way for when one says i follow paul and another i follow apollos are you not merely merely being human what then is apollos and what is paul servants through whom you believed as the lord assigned to each I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his reward according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers and are God's field, God's building, According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. Someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds on it. All right. Anything in there hit you, strike you, uh, just stand out to you? Yeah, there's a very clear distinction in Greek as there is in English between an infant and a child. And what he's doing, he's saying not only a child, meaning usually between the ages of about three, four, or five, uh, as compared to an infant that you're still carrying around everywhere, changing diapers, <clears throat> all that. So how does he label them? Infants. Infants. Yeah, really at the very, very beginning still getting used to getting off of milk and onto more solid food. And yet these people spent a year and a half at least with Paul and now studying under Apollos. This church should have been growing and they're not doing it. 
how can somebody sit under that kind of teaching for so long and still be infants? What's the problem? How else would you describe that problem? Well, he's not questioning their faith. He's, he's calling them brothers. So they're believers in the faith. Under Paul? Under Apollos? I would have thought they were well fed. It doesn't mean that they eat. It just means it's been provided. Yeah, exactly. There's a natural human reluctance to speak up and say the questions that are really on your mind, like that 30 minute pause you had a couple of times. They haven't been participating, and I would guess diagnostically, the Holy Ghost is not working in their next step. Well, they're resisting so much of it. I'm not sure he wasn't working, but. You know, Paul's not questioning the Holy Spirit's job, what he's doing. Cindy, what did you say? I said they're just not doing it themselves. It's just basically what Joe said. You know, it's been, yeah. <laughs> it's been laid out for them, but they're not participating in it. Yeah, how do you sit under teaching for so long and not pick these things up? If I asked you, what did Mark preach on last Sunday or this week before for those of you who weren't here? Do you remember? You see how quickly we forget things? We're not really taking it in and working on it and developing it uh, in our thinking. I think one of the problems that the church has developed over the years when we think of a sermon today, we usually think of somebody getting up in the pulpit and delivering 30, 40 minute lecture and then we leave. Do you think that was like, was like that in the early church? Where were they meeting in the early church? They were meeting at home. And Joe, what, were you, what was your... Right. Our expectation today is no, you shall not speak. You will not make any noise unless the preacher asks you to agree with it. Yeah. <laughs> unless you're a Pentecostal and you're throwing comments out all the time. <laughs> yeah. Because he's the channel of the Spirit. And yeah. Uh, the people at that time, and sitting in somebody's home, and some other Paul letters, they made themselves at home, including sometimes just falling asleep because they overate. Mm -hmm. Probably somebody was irritated because of what happened at work during the day and uh, took it out on Paul. He said, Paul, that didn't make any sense. Explain that again. Exactly. One of the great differences between the sermons today and the early church is you were sitting around in your home. When whoever was doing whatever teaching was going on, and remember, nobody was trained except the apostles. You know, after that, you don't have the training going on. There was no seminaries to go by. And for the most part, and you see this in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul brings it up, he says, when you get together, some of you come with a hymn. Okay? You, in other words, you'd be asked, what do you want to sing today? There was no planned service as, as we would think of it normally, the way we do it. He said, some of you come with a message. In other words, did any of you have a chance to do any study this week? To go down to the local synagogue, get a copy of, of the, one of the scrolls down and, and read from Isaiah or wherever else? Because sometimes people would copy from Isaiah and they'd bring that and they'd read the scripture. Because nobody had a Bible. Whatever teaching was going on, as Joe was just saying, 
if Paul said something and somebody had a question about it, they would just say, Paul, wait a minute, I, I didn't catch that. Would you repeat that? Sermons today, you can't do that. And I, I'm not downplaying sermons. What I'm saying is there are different ways people learn. And one of the ways that happens is by repetition. I don't know if you've ever studied anything about what it takes to remember a TV commercial. But I had somebody who was in a uh, seminar I was doing. This guy taught um, advertising at college. You know how many times you have to see or hear a commercial before you remember it? Depends on how outrageous it is. Very true. Well, and you're looking for them <laughs> during the Super Bowl, yeah. So it's the other ones that they're really concerned about, how many times you have to hear them. It takes an average of seven times before you really start remembering most commercials. What I've done a lot of times with the kids, and, and even since then, since they've left, I've watched a commercial several times, and all of a sudden I'll say to Cindy, I just caught what that commercial was all about. I thought it was a great commercial because of, of what was going on, but I had no clue what they were advertising. Seven times it takes to hear a commercial before you remember it. How many times do we hear everything from the Bible? Sometimes we have to hear it over and over and over again before we really start digesting it. That becomes the, the problem. A lot of churches, what they've done is after they have Sunday school after church, and they do that deliberately because what they do during Sunday school is discuss what went on during the sermon. So they can make sure they caught it, ask questions about it, discuss it in, in more detail. You think of the sermon Mark preached a few year, weeks ago when he went through all the different positions on the millennium. And I'm watching some of the heads around and, and looking at you know, if you hadn't ever had this before, it just went totally over your head because it's it's whole totally new. And Mark did that deliberately because he didn't want you to remember all the other positions. <laughs> not, not true. Uh, but different Christians hold those different positions. So how do you grow? How do you develop? It's a matter of staying in the Word, reading it over and over again, letting it be digested. And Paul saying to them, uh, even as Jim said, they're still... or Jim, Jean, that they're still worldly. They're still so caught up in the world that they're letting that determine what they're believing, how they're living. In other words, what they're learning from the teaching that is going on, went on with Paul, with, went on with Apollos, was not being taken, it was not digested to the point where they're actually able to take that and look at the culture and <coughs> realize the culture is out of whack instead of bringing the culture into their, into their uh, personal lives and that, letting that dictate how they live. They're letting the culture dictate that, not the scripture. There's a lot of things we need to develop uh, in, in doing that. If you want an example of that, look at the current situation politically. How many people are basing uh, our spirituality on where you stand politically? You know, how can you be such and such if, if you hold that position? We have mixed so much of this together. We ch actually start challenging people's salvation by what they're doing politically. Well, if you're supporting abortion and homosexuality... That's not political, that's moral. That's, but that's one, one time. We've made it political, but it's not a political issue. It's a moral issue, and that's where they get it wrong. I'm just saying even who you support you know, and, and things... But there's a lot of ways we can determine our politics by our theology. But not everybody's doing that. Personality should separate it all. Yeah. Character. And we have two characters running. <laughs> I remember a movie, a whole vote that they were pushing for was vote next time saying none of the above. Be interesting if we ever had that, what would happen? Sort of, yeah. Right, right. But I mean, if that ever happened. Yeah. yeah. However it was phrased. But 
Paul is having to deal with this. This is a church that has been around for several years, still has not grown very much. And we see this in every church. How much, how many years have you been a Christian? How many years have you really known you've grown a lot? And that's what we're doing on Wednesday nights, of course, dealing with this whole as aspect of spiritual growth uh, and looking at how we can measure all that. So hopefully we'll get beyond that. But Paul was really stuck having to deal with that. The amazing is amazing act of God and the Holy Spirit that there's the growth, first of all, the Corinthians, a major worldly area. I don't mm -hmm. imagine they had anyone could take a Bible home. No. Nope. <laughs> I mean, only one person had some shreds of paper. I mean, how many people had the Old Testament back then to teach them too? Nobody. It, it, well, there was no Old Testament. There was just scrolls, and not every synagogue had every scroll. And the New Testament would have been just what Paul... What New Testament was there at this point? Yeah, it would have been just the, what he told them, what he taught them. Yeah. And they would have to memorize it. The only thing that was around before this of New Testament would have been the book of James. That was early enough. You would have had First and Second Thessalonians, which were Paul's first, uh, second and third letter, and his first letter was to the Galatians, and that was it. And that was starting to be passed around. How much of that was in Corinth at this time, you know, we don't know, but that still would have been very little as compared to the size of what we carry around in terms of the whole Bible. So there are a lot, there's a lot more innocence going on here, there, in Corinth, than we have excuses for here. There is no excuses. You've got programs on television, radio, it, it, books that are out there. Uh, this country especially has a lot to answer for. The church in this country has, is without excuse for being as weak as it is. And I'll just say this as, never saying it as an aside, but I'll tell you the number one problem the church has in this country is we have lost our doctrine of God, who he is, his holiness, his separateness from who we are. And we've reduced him to being whatever we have made. we put God back in whatever box we have it. And that's where we are. Once we lost our doctrine of God, we lost our doctrine of sin. And you look at what the church has accepted. How even in so many churches, the issue of abortion can be debated as if, as if it's a debatable subject. We understood God. We understand why he created man. And that man is the most special thing in the universe to God. To do anything to God's people. He says in Genesis, he said if, if anybody takes somebody else out, their life is to be forfeited. Why? Because that person was made in the image of God. Period. So, this is where the Corinthians are. This is what Paul is having to deal with. So he goes into the first thing there and starts dealing with the leadership that goes on there. Saying, okay, you, you guys are so wrapped up in the leadership of who you're following, you're not understanding the fact of what the leadership is. The leaders, the leaders of a church are to be what? The ones most obedient to the Holy Ghost. And what to the people? Servants. What? Servants. Servants. Yeah. We're here to serve. Not to lord it over us. And in every denomination we've got this. I used to describe the difference in the Church of England in South Africa that we belonged to because we wouldn't even step foot in most of the Presbyterian churches down there. Very liberal or very charismatic. Um, the Church of England was, was very much like what the ARP and the PCA is like here. I, I usually tell people the only difference between the Church of England in South Africa and the Presbyterian churches like, like us today is the fact that they admit to having bishops. We have bishops in our churches too. But they're self-proclaimed. You know, I'm in charge. I'm in, I, I came in as a pastor of this church. I'm in charge. No, you're not. God has said you ought to serve this church. And Mark has made that very, very clear throughout his time here. He said, my job is to do what Scripture says, and that's to, to train the elders to do the work of the ministry. Oh, I don't, yeah. Uh, which elder? Bull elder. 
I haven't heard that one. Tell me. That, that's the one who's not ordained as a minister who still has his way in a congregation. Who oh. will <laughs> okay. Yeah, I can. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Been there. Had those. <laughs> Everyone recognizes the concept, even if you don't know that you can't do everything. Well, I, I thought it was an actual term. I didn't realize it was a colloquial. <laughs> Now that I understand what you mean, yes. <laughs> yeah, I'll agree with that entirely. So Paul is trying to put everybody in their place in terms of understanding that we're just servants here. That's all we are. Don't set us up on a pedestal as if we're supposed to be doing all of the work that everybody is supposed to be doing together. But number three on your sheet there. Such servants, like Paul and Apollos, are not to be compared to one another. For neither is anything, he says. They are both one, he says in verse 8. What does he mean by that? They're both one. They serve a common purpose. One in purpose. And what should be the purpose of the leaders of a church? Number one. Go higher. <laughs> yeah, they're here to serve God initially. Secondarily, they're here to teach. They're here to, to give us what we don't have. Pastors in the early years of the church didn't have the background, didn't have the education. Yeah. What happened by the time we get to the second century is bishops really do exist, and the bishops that were there were like the bishops that they had in the Church of England in South Africa, which I really appreciated. Their bishops could make no determinations of things that dictated to the congregation. Their bishops were uh, pastoral bishops. They were in charge of a certain area, and they would be the pastors to the pastors of other churches. Well, it's the Church of England, but not the Anglican Church. Yeah, the Church of England in South Africa is not the Anglican Church, like Desmond Tutu, if you remember that name. Very, very liberal, theologically. Church of England was a very, very solid denomination down there. Um, but their bishops were much more like the early church was, where you would basically be there to help train the next generation of who would be the elders in the churches. And they needed that because there were no seminaries. But it wasn't until probably the third century or even the fourth century after the church became legal in the, in the Roman world, where you started having congregations big enough where you couldn't have just a conversation going on in a worship service. So services like we know them now really developed in 3rd and 4th century where you would have somebody who would get up there and speak, and in fact you had a large enough con a congregation, you couldn't have a lot of discussion going on. Especially when you know, if you asked a question, that one person was going to answer every single time. Yeah. And you almost have to say to that person, let somebody else speak. You, know, you can't control 300 people if that's the size of the congregation that you've got. It just doesn't work that way. So the church evolved, and that's not a bad thing. You know, just like the sermons that we have today is not a bad thing. It's where we are. But how are we learning? Are we doing our best to learn from what we hear each week? Are we taking from what Mark says each week and actually continuing to work on it, to learn it, so that it becomes more than milk? Well, that's what he's getting at here. But he goes on to say in verse 8, he says, They are one in purpose. That's to glorify God and to serve the church. And he says, And to each one, to each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. So we get into the whole subject of rewards here. He's saying, yeah, you're not going to get rewarded for what the servants of the church do, the leaders of the church. You're going to get rewarded for what you do. So let's not worry about who's in charge and who you're following. Let's worry about who you, what, what you're doing. How are you growing? What are you doing in order to serve the church? But last sentence there. Know that the criterion that Paul gives is not success but what we do, our labors. 
the way we serve the Lord. As Joe was just saying, the bull elders would not be the ones interested in serving. They'd really be, want to be the ones being served and making sure that everybody follows what they want. Not the way God had it lined up. But then it gets, it gets into this whole concept in verse 9, where he says, For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field. That is, God's building. Think about that. Think of yourself as a building under construction. Does your building have walls yet? A, seat, a roof? You know, where are we at in terms of our own lives? What we know? One of the things I've suggested to Mark that we just haven't gotten around to doing, I guess, uh, I, I was suggesting that every week in, at the beginning of the church service, we pass out a little piece of paper to everybody just asking one question. A question like, do you believe that Jesus Christ is God? Do you believe in the Trinity? Nothing more than that. Just asking everybody to, to check the box or answer the question very briefly. Put that in the offering and then collect it. The reason for that is even basic doctrine sometimes is totally missed. I'll give you an example. Years ago, church I was in in Peoria, found out that the Jehovah's Witnesses were coming that summer to have their annual conference in Peoria, Illinois. And uh, come to find out, because we had these cult watch groups that are out there that are actually infiltrated a lot of the cults and know, what's, know a lot of what's going on in there. But one of, the things, one of the strategies they have when they come to your city and have their convention is they will go out within a 10 to 20 mile radius of that church and their goal for that week is to reach every single home in that area and try to get into it and witness and, and spread their lies about what they believe Christianity to be. Well, we found out about a year or two before that Peoria was going to get this. And so I, I belonged to five different ministerial associations at that time as I was developing a Bible college in Peoria. And we put together a strategy. I found one lady whose father was one of the leaders in, in Jehovah's Witnesses. And she wrote two things for us. She wrote a track about the size of a bulletin insert. Uh, that, and then it was a second track inside. The outside track was supposed to be for the people that you would pass this out to your neighbors saying, the Jehovah's Witnesses are coming. Here's what they believe. And so they would show those four pages of the bulletin uh, on their doctrine. And the objective was to say then, when they come to your door, don't let them in, but give them that middle sheet of paper, which then explain to the Jehovah's Witnesses some of their false teaching and asking them to look it up in their own readings, their own books which disprove their own teachings. It's amazing how much cults contradict themselves. So in our own church, um, I suggested to our pastor, I said, we need to do a lot more teaching on the Trinity, on the deity of Christ and all that. And the pastor's comment to me was, well, I don't have that much theological background. Uh, he had been to Bible college, but not the seminary. He said, I don't feel comfortable doing that. So he asked me to do it. So I, I preached one morning on the deity of Christ and proving that Jesus is God. The main elder for the church came up to me afterwards and grabbed me and pulled me aside and said, what are you teaching? We don't believe that here. We believe Jesus is the son of God, not that he's God. So I quickly called the pastor over. I said, Don, I want you to listen to this, what your father-in-law just said. <laughs> Got the connection? And his jaw just dropped. He had been hearing this year after year. Remember what I said about having to hear something seven times before you start taking it in and understanding it? I don't know how many times over the years he was a Christian he had heard the fact that Jesus is God, but to him that never sunk in. Never sunk in. When the surveys have gone out to different churches, uh, not to different churches, but uh, groups like the Barna group and all, uh, who do, does nothing but research different religious topics around the country to find out what Christians believe. It was appalling to see the results that came back from those who claimed to be from Bible-believing, gospel-preaching churches. 
that let almost 50% of the church did not believe that Jesus was God. These are very solid churches. What's going on? That we're not growing. We're still not picking up the basics. Well, for one thing, we fight against the world, the flesh, and the devil. And Satan will do everything he possibly can, especially in the doctrine of God, to destroy that. But part of our labor is to get into the Word, to investigate it, to be doing our, our, our reading, our studying. It's not just up to what we get from the pulpit, not what we get from here, but what we're able to put together by way of the truth. And that is so critical, so, so critical. Number four in your sheet there. This line of thought leads, uh, thought leads Paul to use the illustration of these believers being God's building. And in doing so, Paul speaks of himself as the wise or master builder, my translation has, uh, who has laid the foundation. You might want to pencil this in, in your Bible. The word master builder there, does anybody have another translation? Says so anything else? That's in verse eight, uh, verse 10, you know. Expert builder. Expert builder. A wise master builder. Wise master builder. Uh, if you put notes in your Bible, put this down. The Greek word, I'll give you the Greek word, architect. The designer. Not just the master builder, but the one who designs the building in the first place. I wish they would have left that word alone and just given us the Greek word. Because to talk about a master builder is one thing, to talk about the architect gives another dimension to it. Huh. But, but the builder gives another dimension to architects as well. Yeah. The fellow who puts it down on paper may not be able to handle a trial or a hammer. Right. But in those days, he was out there doing all of that. Architects now just are the ones who just put the blueprints together. Back then, he would have been the builder as well, designing all that. Because very few people were doing that for a living, designing other buildings, but some did. But that's where the word comes from. But note this, those buildings, those building on the one foundation, which is what Paul is talking about, involve all these believers in the Corinthian body of Christ. It is not just the leadership. And this brings Paul to write one of the most important discourses on rewards for the believers in the New Testament, which is what I thought we'd get into today, but we'll just get it started. Let me read from 11 to 15. I'm going to start with verse 10, though. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, the architect, I laid a foundation, and so someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest. For the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has, has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. One foundation. You know, the architect just says, all right, put the foundation down, but it has to be so-and-so. The cornerstone. What is a cornerstone today for a building? It's just a, basically a plaque saying this building was erected in such and such a year, maybe putting somebody's name down who designed it or whatever. You know what the cornerstone was for a building back then? Yeah, that first stone that was set was the most important one because that would set the direction of everything else in the building. That was the cornerstone. 
And Jesus himself said that he was the cornerstone. But that foundation, Paul now expands and says that whole foundation is Christ. And everything needs to be built on that. You see why I keep emphasizing the fact that once we've lost our doctrine of God, everything else falls apart. The foundation is gone. How can anything else really stay stable? Jesus is that foundation for the body of Christ, for the rest of the building, for it to go up and be properly built as it goes along. If each man builds upon it, then there is individual responsibility. This involves the use of one's spiritual gifts. I want to read something to you. I, I don't normally read much to you. I try not to, at least. But I got this from MacArthur's commentaries. MacArthur usually does a pretty good job on his commentaries. Not everything I agree with. I don't agree with anybody on, any, on everything. I guess. But he, he brings this point out. He says, We build for the Lord and use the various materials for the Lord in three basic ways. By our motives, by our conduct, and by our service. I like that breakdown. Scripturally, he can back that up in different places, and he does. But he brings this out. Let me read the first one here. First, we build our motives. Why we do a thing is as important as what we are doing. A campaign of neighborhood visitation done because of compulsion is wood. It gets burned up. But visiting the same people in love to win them to the Lord is gold and remains. Singing a solo in church or in a choir and being con concerned about how people like our voice is hay that gets burned up. But singing to glorify the Lord is silver, and that remains. Giving generously out of duty or pressure from someone else is straw that gets burned up. But giving generously with, a, with joy to extend the gospel uh, and to serve others in the Lord's name is precious stone. Work, is on the out, uh, work that on the outside looks like gold to us may really be hay in God's eyes. He knows the motives of our hearts. And then he talks about our conduct. What are we like? Is our conduct here at church one thing and something else different when we leave? And the third thing he talks about is service. And there he talks about in particular what I've just mentioned about spiritual gifts. As many people as we have in the church, how many people are really using their gifts? And the problem is, when we don't have everybody using their gift, it's like having, as Paul brings out in chapter 12 of, of Corinthians, it's like having a body, but the legs aren't working. Yeah, the legs just decide, I, I have gift of being able to walk and do all these things, but I'm just not going to use it. And the body becomes crippled because of that. Everybody needs to be doing whatever their gift is in the church. Now, there's a lot more gifts than what, was, what is just listed there in Corinthians and in the other places that mention gifts. There's a lot of other ways we can serve. One of the greatest gifts I think that there is, and I'm surprised the Holy Spirit didn't give it there in any of the lists. Not that I'm trying to correct the Holy Spirit. I've got to be careful there. But it's the gift of prayer. Someone who just has that gift of saying, tell me what's going on. What can I be praying for? You know, that's a special person. And there's one person in the church that's always writing cards to people for encouragement. I know one lady who took, had the church list of everybody's birthdays in the church, and every birthday she would send a, a card to them with a special note to everybody. Just the aspect of encouragement. There's all kinds of different ways we can serve. And what he's saying is we cripple the body and lose our gifts when we don't use them. Or we use them for the wrong motives. We do it to show off. That doesn't account for anything. 
if I was here just building myself up. That's not the point. Especially if I was here saying how much better I am than Mark or something like that. Again, like Paul and Apollos trying to compare things. It, it, it's not glorifying God whatsoever. That's not serving. Using our gifts he is. The building material is of two kinds, he says. One that's worthless and one that's good. And it's interesting he divides up some of the translations have bad or evil for the other side and good for the other one. There's two words in Greek for the word good. Always translated good in English. This is why I keep saying you need to get rid of your English Bibles and really learn Greek. But they mean very different things. The word good, in a general sense, the one word, is just a general way of saying, yeah, that's good. You know, that, that's a good table, whatever. But the other one has a very special meaning. It means morally good. When we talk about God's attribute of being good, he uses this word, that he is morally good, not just good in general, because morally good means good in every way. But he means specifically morally good. And that's the word he uses here. Greek is a lot more specific in terms of dividing things up. Hebrew does it in, in pictures. Now, there's only one word in Hebrew for it, but I don't get the picture there as I do with these two words being defined like they are in the Greek. So that's what I'm asking. What's the difference between being morally good? I think that's the imperfect. Yeah. And holy. Well, morally good just means it's, it's a do something that, that's morally good. Well, you, know, you, you ask a good question. There's an emphasis on the moral side of it. Rather than this table being good, there's nothing morally good about the table. It's just good. But we're talking about something that, that's a higher level of real goodness that has to do with how we function on a God level because that's one of the attributes of God that we share in common with God that he gives us in his, from his image is that moral goodness that we, unlike all the animals, are morally good, not just good. Animals can't be morally good. That's not part of their makeup. But I've got to quit. Choir's going to miss me. Not much. Um, but didn't get as far as I'd hoped, but we'll continue from there the next time. So let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for what it teaches. Lord, I just pray for each of us that we would really try better to remember the things that we're taught, to live them out in our character, in our motives, in our service, in every way. Not just because we want crowns, rewards when we get to heaven, but because we want to serve and honor and glorify you by our lives. Teach us all over again the things that we need to relearn, that we might remember them and keep you foremost in everything that we do, especially as we go into worship you. May we consciously do everything in a way that you would enjoy hearing from us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all.